session in uh, chapter two of your textbook, that is part three of that. Um, well, let me start the course from the part we stopped last time. So we discussed that. Um, we discussed that. I don't know what's going on with this. Okay, maybe I have to. Okay. We discussed that um, whenever you have a model, whenever you have a model, Um, your model, or better say, your error in your model has two parts, reducible sable, plus irreducible error. The ir irreducible error is just variance of, of your error. That's the part of error that always exists. We should not, we should not do anything about it. If we go after this error, what we are doing is uh, overfitting. This part which is called reducible error is composed of two parts. One is called bias, bias. one is called variance. Loosely speaking, variance um, is from training set to training set. Let's say we have training 1 and then we feed our model to it. Let's call it f hat 1x. Then we have training set two. We say we, we we feed the same linear or nonlinear model to it, but since we use di different training models, we get different uh, values, uh, different functional form for that. Let's say we use n of these uh, training sets. Get f hat of n. Uh, if you use more flexible functions, when you use more flexible functions. So let's say flexibility goes up. Since the more flexible functions that get different functional forms, the variance, which is the differences of these models that you predicted, goes up. The variance of f hat will go up. At the same time, whenever flexibility goes up, Ability goes up, usually bias will go down. Why? Because you can go after individual observations. So our irreducible part which has bias and variance, bias and variance, um, works into two different ways with your flexibility. The variance itself increases when you increase flexibility. Bias, bias decreases with flexibility. Bias decreases with flexibility. So let me get back to the point. Um, okay, we stopped here. Okay, so the total error we have, the total error we have, which is this part, this is total error, is composed of bias and variance, which are part of our reducible error, and variance, which is irreducible. And the point that was made was when you, want, when you increase flexibility, variance goes up, bias goes down, and vice versa. And this is called the bias-variance uh, trade-off. So let me look at, uh, look at three different uh, graphs. In all of these graphs, this orangish uh, curve represents variance. Um, this bluish curve represents bias, and the summation of the two is the ir ir uh, reducible error of your test set. So the summation of these two plus the variance of irreducible error is this red curve. Usually we can only observe this red curve. But theoretically, we should know what, how, how we get this nice convex shape. And whenever you get a nice convex shape, it always has a minimum. So I want to tell you why this is happening. So in my first graph, which is at the top left, uh, at the left of the, uh, the slide, we have a relatively flexible function. It, the optimal level of flexibility is 6. So let's see what will happen to its bias. When you increase flexibility from 2, let's say, to 6, it drastically decreases the bias, then it becomes flat, and the variance goes up 
um, drastically when you exceed 5. So there is a sweet spot here, which is this part, which rela relates to flexibility 6. Here we have, so, so, so in this uh, function, in this graph, we see that the bias and variance have same weight in deciding what, what the optimal level is, because they, they both contributed to this optimality. Uh, now let's look at very unflexible function. So let's say this is the reality. That is the best flexibility that describes my model, which has flexibility 3. That's a very non-flexible function. Here we see that the variance of the curve increases drastically when you exceed 3, but the bias almost remains the same. So the main contributor to this shape was this variance. Because the more flexibility you chose, the, va the variance increased substantially. So, so that was why we get this shape, and that is why um, uh, we, re we reached into this number of flexibility. At the last, we have a very flexible function. The optimality happened at 10. Here we see that bias had more weight on this shape than, than variance because it was an already flexible function. So adding more flexibility didn't change variance that much, but it drastically decreased the bias. And that is why the minimize happened here. So, so the points that I wanted to make here is that whenever you have low flexibility, the shape mainly caused by variance. When you have high flexibility, the shape you get for your training error, MSC of your training, which is this red one, mainly is affected by this uh, bias curve and when you have a, um, a relatively flexible function, a relatively inflexible function, something in the middle of the two of the curves you see that both of these curves contribute to that red one. So, so the red curve in all of these cases is the um, yellow curve or brown curve brown plus this blue curve or green curve, depending on your case, plus you, my irreducible error. Irreducible error is constant. It doesn't change from functional form to another one. The ones that are going to change are these brown and blue ones, and I showed you which one is contributing more to the shape in this slide. Now let's work on something more interesting. We are done with quantitative variables. Let's work on classification problems. In classification problems, you're trying to assign your quantitative um, uh, some inputs, which can be both quantitative and um, categorical, to some output which is always categorical. Some of the examples we had earlier uh, was, for example, deciding whether or not um, the letters in the letter. Uh, the, the words in a letter result in a spam email. So, so you want to decide whether y your email is spam or ham. And by the way, ham is a technical term that is given to okay emails. You want to decide whether it's spam or ham based on the letter, the, the words in the, in, in the letter. Okay, usually if, for example, um, usually if in your email you have deal or offer or uh, you, customer, something like that, 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 that's usually spam. But whenever they have your, uh, usually when they have your, um, let's say, your first name, or family name, or something very personal about you, it's usually ham, so it's related to you. So based on the words that are in your letter, um, you want to decide whether it's a spam or ham. That's, that's one case that you want to uh, categorize your email based on the probability they have. It might, you might have an email that has deal inside it and it's still ham, but, we, but, but most, you want to have the probability of these assignments. Another case that, um, we can we can discuss is when you want to uh, assign handwriting to specified categories so we have 10 categories from 0 to 9 so you want to see which how this uh, the number you see 
corresponds to each one of these categories. The way that it's done in computer science is that um, you have a block that your number is written inside it and you have pixels here. So depending on the shape of these pixels, you want to decide which one it belongs to. So one person may write nine this way, another one this way, another person may, may write it this way. So there are, there are different handwritings. They're not identical. You want to decide which class it is. Let's say we, you have a number, um, you have a number like this. Um, you, have an, you, you see a handwriting like this. So, there's, uh, so for example, your algorithm should decide what is the percentage of the times you assign it to zero, what is the percentage of time you assign it to one, and so on and so forth. So let's say your algorithm finds it is 0% chance that what you've written belongs to zero. There is 20% chance that it, it belongs to one. 40% uh, chance that it belongs to 2, 30% chance it belongs to 3, and so on and so forth. So based on this information, your algorithm decides that 2 is the correct option. In the case of the previous example, let's say you have an email, it has some names on it, and it has deal inside it as well, then let's say your algorithm decides it's 70% ham, 30% spam. Um, if based on that it decides that you decide it's ham because 70% chance that it's ham. So in classification problems you want to find the probabilities that based on the outputs you have which might be pixels of your handwriting it might be letters that are in your um, in your uh, email decide whether your output is spam or ham or the, uh, the pixels represent 0, 1, 2 through 9. So that is called the classification problem. So let's see what, how we should deal with classification problems. Let's, uh, let's work with an easy example. Very easy example. Let's say we have number of accounts in our x variable. And let's say probability of default is here. Probability of default. Okay. So, so it, this is the very rich data set, has a lot of information in it. So for every single number of account, we have a lot of observations here. And now I assume there is, um, uh, okay, so let me change the number of accounts to something, something else. Let's assume x variable is number of years of credit history, of credit history. And orange represents default. Um, blue represents no default. So okay, so so orange is default, uh, um, and blue is no default. Usually, when you have more credit history, it is, it is less likely that you default. That's most of the cases, except for very young um, young accounts. So here we have information of all people. Let's say we have information of all 300 million Americans on this. And some credit companies really have this much information, like Experian or other credit company, um, credit company Burroughs. So if you want to decide, whether, uh, so you can easily measure how many, what is the percentage of people who, ha who really defaulted versus who didn't in this case. For example, let's focus on the people who had five years of credit history. Five years of credit history. So for these people, um, for these people, for these specific people, um, let's say you find thousand of them from your data set. Thousand of them have defaulted. Four thousand of them did not. So what is the probability of default? By this way, it's 80%. So this black curve represents the probability of default for every single one you have in your data set. For example, in this case, let's say you will find that um, 400 defaulted, 400 default, sorry, 600 defaulted, 400 did not. So what is the probability of 
uh, no default is only 40%. Or let me change the value such that it coincides. So let's say 700 defaulted. Let's say 700 defaulted, 300 did not. So the probability of no default will be 0.3. So if you have a very rich data set like this, it's pretty easy to decide whether um, to, to, to run this uh, black graph and decide whether to assign one person in this category or the other one. Okay, so, so basically um, if you have all information like that, you can get it a probability function like this. Whenever it's more than 50%, you assign it to no default case. If it's less than 50%, you assign it to this orange case, whatever it is. And now I assume it's default case. Um, we can see that it's a clear cut here, which it, which belongs to 50%, and that belongs to number of years of four. So, so this model predicts that if you have more than four years of credit credit history, it's less likely that you will default. So your category will be no default. If you are less than uh, four years, you have less than four years of history, there is more likely that you will default. default. And this is called the Bayes uh, optimal classifier because you had every single observation so you have the correct probability function here. But usually in reality, we have very sparse data sets. We, we do not have information of all values and specifically we do not have that much rich information for instance you may not have anyone in this category so here we cannot say anything so the, re the, the way we can solve it is that for example if you want to um, estimate what is the probability of default if you have five years of history you build up a neighborhood around five years and you measure how many people have defaulted, how many did not. So here in this neighborhood, we have three people who defaulted. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven people who didn't. So seven people, no default. Three people default. So, so our prediction is 70% chance of no default. So if you repeat that na closest neighborhood, um, averaging method we can get this um, nice clear we can get this uh, empirical probability function again in this probability function I think again we get reached to the same conclusion around four years before four years we have more than 50 percent chance of default or less than 50 percent of no default after that we have more than 50 percent chance of no default so that would be your clear cut. But as you can see, this empirical probability function, though looks so much like this, it's not identical to reality. Usually in most of the cases, we deal with the same um, situations. We usually have the same thing. So let me move on. So, so one question that some of you may ask, and that's a very legitimate, legitimate question to ask, is whether, uh, how, do, how can we know what neighborhood we should search? Should we search only for this neighborhood or we increase our neighborhood to this for five? You can change the neighborhood size to any value that as, at your view, but what is the optimal level of that? The answer to it is through test data. The answer to this is, you have to choose different neighborhoods and choose the one that results in the minimum test error. So here, you say the best way to test whether um, uh, whether your model is doing well or no is to find the average error in your test data set. And the way it does is that it, it averages out the times in your training data, in your test data, that your actual outcome is different from what you predicted for that. C hat x i is what you predicted based on the models you have. Y i is um, what actually is. The, the, you, you just count the number of times that, that they are not equal, that you're making errors, so you take an average of that. For example, so let me give an example here. 
let's say this, here we have years of history and this is default, no default and this is our prediction uh, let, me, let me write it in another in this one that gives you better time okay so let's say these are years of history history here is actual default no default actual default no default case and here is our prediction And remember, uh, our prediction is uh, whenever you have more than four years of history, you predict it will have no default. If it's less than four years, you, you predict it has default, okay? So let's say you have a person who had seven years of history, he did not default. You have six years of history, he did default. Four, three years of history, he didn't default. Um, 4.5 years of history, and he actually did not default. So let's see how much error we are making now. What is our prediction for a person who had seven years of history? Think about it. Our model would predict no default for those who have more than four years. So for seven years of history, our prediction is no default. For six years of history, since more than four years, our, our prediction is no default. For three years, our prediction is default. For 4.5 years, since it's more than four years, it's no default. So how many times we mismatched reality with our prediction two times out of four so how much is my error my error is one over two or fifty percent so let me explain what that weird function does uh, there was a function it's called average of times that within your training set within your train test set your reality is not equal to um, what you predicted so this function gives values one for the cases that the condition under it holds and zero otherwise so no default no default are they unequal no so you get zero Default, no default. Are they unequal? Yes. So the outcome of that would be 1. No default, default. Are they different? Yes, 1. No default, no default. Are they unequal? No, 0. So what is the average of these four numbers? 1.5. So you can, you can find error either with this traditional method or finding it through a more refined mathematical formulation. Okay, so let me get back to my slide here. Um, later on in the course, perhaps not in the course that I'm teaching to you now, uh, in more advanced ones, we're going to um, cover support vector machines that will put some functional forms on c hat x, which predicts your, your outcome. And let, let me continue the course based on a very nice representation. Um, so let's say um, we have years of education, years of credit history. We also have uh, number of accounts here let's say so we so, so in this case we have number of accounts accounts so usually when you have more accounts and number of years of history is a lot you're less prone to default so this orange care orange -ish points here are representing no default um, this blue is probability of default in your history I'm just making up this example it's not reality okay I just want to make it sensible 
this is a numerical example, doesn't bear any physical meaning, but let's assume x1 is years of education history. These blue curves are representing default. These oranges representing no default. And you have years of history versus number of accounts. So let's say this dashed area is the real boundary of default and no default. So that's the base classifier. So if you have observations of every single one in your population, that would be the classifier you would find which would bear the least misclassification error. But in reality, we do not have this, um, this uh, clear cod Bayesian classifier because we do not have information of every single person. We only have it for limited number of people and limited number of observations. Um, the way you're going to solve these problems is through something called k-nearest neighborhood. k-nearest neighborhood. It can be one nearest neighborhood, two nearest neighborhood, and up to anything. So let's say what, what it is. For example, you want to you wanna categorize a point that is here. What, and based on three nearest neighborhood. What you need to find is three nearest neighbors around it. Let's say these three dots are three nearest around it. And then you will count number of categories that are in each one of them. Here, there's 100% chance that it belongs to you because all of these three are blue. Now let's work on a person who is here. He has this as its nearest, then second nearest, and perhaps this is third nearest. There's two-thirds probability to belong to blue, one-third to yellow. So it belongs to blue. So let's work on this point. This point has one blue, one orange, the second one is also orange, so two-third probability that it belongs to orange. So with k nearest neighborhood, we can find this clear cost. This these boundaries would be the boundaries that have exactly 50% chance to belong to one clan, another 50% to another category. So here uh, you see the clear cut result based on k nearest neighborhood, based on uh, 10 uh, nearest neighborhood. So every time you just look at 10 nearest neighbors, and based on that, you decide which one, uh, which category you belong to. This um, black curve represents um, does represent our um, this black curve does represent the boundary you get based on this k equal to 10 and in this case uh, if, if for some points like this one it found f five of the closest neighbors are blue five of them are orange it, belong, it, it, it categorizes it as uh, boundary because it's 50% chance that it belongs to one, 50% to that one. So let's see what will happen if we decrease number of Ks and increase it. So here we have K equal to one. So anytime we only look at one nearest neighbor. As you can see, we get this very curvy function as a result of classifier. That's very curvy. You have small islands somewhere because in these cases, the only closest variable you find is this blue one. Now let's increase it to 100, and then now you see the boundary is really linear. So, so what one thing we can learn from here is that when we increase k, we decrease flexibility. For k equal to one, we got a very flexible boundary. For a, k equal to 100, we get almost linear boundary. So, the more k, the less flexibility. Now a legitimate question to ask is, what is the best k that I can choose? The answer to that is simple. Whenever you do not know which uh, amount of flexibility you need to choose, you must stick to um, your test errors. And you just set aside some test error somewhere, train your data, meaning that find this classifier boundaries based on your training data, and then see how much test error you will incur for those on unused data set. And then the one that is producing the least amount of uh, test error is the one that you should always choose. So, so here, 
uh, we see that so let me explain what what are our um, what are our axes x represents 1 over k so 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 here 1 over k is equal to 1 therefore k is equal to 1 here 1 over k is 0 0.01 therefore k is 100 here 1 over k is 0 0.02 therefore k is 50 so when we go this way flexibility increases why because I told you in k nearest neighbor neighborhoods whenever you increase k you decrease flexibility so when you decrease k you increase flexibility so that is about this part of it on this part we have error rate we have the blue curve which represents which represents our training error of course training error will decrease whenever you choose more flexible functions that that is something we always had earlier but one thing we should care about is how much flexibility we should choose based on our test error. And this is our test error. One thing we can easily observe here is that um, we have a shape like this, which is minimized around, uh, which is minimized around 0 0.01. So, um, uh, so, so the place that is minimized is around 0 0.01 so 1 over k is 0 0.1 so what is the amount of flexibility that we should choose? k equal to 10 that is the best flexibility that we can choose and, and there is no surprise that k equal to 10 give us a boundary very close to base real boundary so you know this base real boundary is only known by God we can only find it for simulated data so so in reality we don't have that because we do not know the underlying real distribute and distribution function but as we can see um, visually when k was 10 it was very very close to that dashed line whereas in these two cases when we use a very flexible function around k equal to 1 versus very unflexible function which is k equal to 100 we got a very uh, different picture. So let me use some KNN examples uh, and I'm going to use Excel because it does it does help us to understand it better so I just run my example here let's say we have six people so let's say so label of person so let's, let's call it so let's call it person one, person two. Let me zoom in a little bit to make it more. Okay, person two, person three, person four, person five, and person six. Let's say we have their height in centimeter and weight in kilogram. So the first person is higher than 180, 85 kilograms. The other one is 185, 70 kilograms. The other one is 156. Um, uh, 156 and 40 kilogram. Then we have uh, 190 with 150 kilograms. Then we have 189 with. Uh, 78 kilograms and lastly we have uh, a six person has is um, is two meters is Michael Jordan maybe two meters and uh, 100 kilograms so he so their weight is status for so the first person is just normal the second person is underweight this next person is also underweight then we have very underweight, oh, very overweight. Then we have normal, maybe, uh, and we have overweight. And let's say the BMI of these people are as follows. So the first person has a BMI of 24, the next person has 19, the next person has 18, 17, the other one has a BMI of 35. 
the next one has BMI of 23 and the next one has BMI of 40. So let's say we want to use, uh, let's say we, we want to predict what is, first, what is the status of person 7? Second, what is the BMI of that based on k equal to 1, k equal to 2, k equal to 2, and k equal to 3. So we want to look at our predictions for that person, both on the status of him and the BMI. Status or category of it or BMI. Okay, so um, so let's say the, the, this person is 165 centimeters and, and and 60 kilograms. Okay, so 665 and 60. So height and weight. Height and weight. So this person is. 165 and 60. So the first thing we need to do is to find the distances of this person with each one of them. So the way you find the distance of this person with any one of them is through Euclidean distance. That is how you do it. So the Euclidean distance of, let's say we have x0, x1 and y1, and you have x2 and y2. The Euclidean distance would be a square root of x1 minus x2 squared plus y1 minus y2 squared. That would be the, the, the difference of these two people. For example, if one person is uh, 100, uh, 160 centimeters and 55 kilograms, the other one is 170 centimeters and 70 kilograms. The, 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 the linear difference between the two is square root of 170 minus 160 squared plus 55 minus, uh, sorry, 70 minus 55 squared. 55 squared. So we, we are going to do exactly the same thing here, but I'm going to use technology to do that. I'm using Excel. So let's do that. So that would be square root of this guy minus this guy dollar sign uh, don't worry about these notations because we are not going to excel in the use excel in the class but it helps our life be easier okay. plus 85 minus 60 squared okay so that will be the distances of each one of our variables with uh, person 7 with each one of these variables so what is the prediction for k equal to 1 for the status of this person so we have to find the least distance we find the least distance we find is regarding the third person the third person was underweight. You see the third person has the smallest distance and this person was underweight. underweight. So our decision is underweight. Based on key, k, k equal to 2, we find the two closest observations which would be these two, right? Uh, the two closest uh, are these two and th these are both underweight so our prediction is underweight. Based on k3, the three closest one, two of them are here and third one is here. Two of them are underweight, the another one is normal, so our prediction would be again underweight. There's a two third probability of that. Now let's look at BMIs. Based on k equal to one, the closest one we have here is this one. What is our prediction for that person three is 17. So our prediction for that guy will be 17 as well. For two nearest neighbors, we have these two people. Um, one is 17, the other one is 19, so our prediction would be the average of the two, 17 plus 19 divided by 2, which is, oops, um, um, plus 19 divided by which is 18, and the last one needs three closest people, here we have three closest people, 17, 19, and 24, we just need to get the average of the three. 
20. So based on KNN of 1 degrees of uh, KNN of K equal to 1, our prediction is underweight. The BMI prediction is 17. So K equal to 2, our prediction is underweight. The BMI prediction is 18. The third one has, um, again, our prediction is underweight. And the BMI prediction is 20. That concludes our course today. We are done with chapter 2. Congratulations.